Before we dive into the text, though, I want to make two very important observations. And uh, so important, you, you might want to write these down. They're not in your blanks, they're not on your outlines, but, but these are important observations for this particular text that we are going into. The first is this, God is awesome. Has anybody noticed? <laughs> All right, yeah, that's good. Three of you, great. One, two, three. Uh, God is awesome. No matter how you slice it, He's awesome. But today's text is, is going to show us God's awesome in a different way than you might think. Um, I, I don't know how we're going to walk out of here today when we're done, but I'm confident of this. You and I, we, we might walk out of here with a different perspective. We might walk out of here with a different point of view. You might say, preacher, you're wrong. I know exactly what happened there. Good for you. Okay, I don't, but good for you if you do. But here's what I'm confident of. We will walk out of here united by this one thing. Our God is an awesome God. I'm reminded of a story that I read some years ago about a young boy. I think it said he was around 11 or 12. He was sitting at a bus stop and he was reading his Bible as he was waiting for the, the bus to arrive to take him home. And a college student walked up, a young man, and sat next to him. And the college student was, you know, an academic. He was smart. He was wise to the ways of the world. And he looked at the boy and he said, why are you reading that? And the boy said, because God is great and I love him. Amen. Eager to show his superior intelligence and understanding of life and the world, the college student said, God is not great. And all that stuff you're reading about in the Bible is made up or easily explainable. And the boy said, well, well I, don't, I don't think so. And he, and, and he said, why don't you think so? And he said, well, for example, the, this is the boy, he said, I just got through reading about God bringing his people across the Red Sea on dry ground. How is that easily explainable? I mean, that right there all by itself proves that God is great and God is awesome. And the college student, he smirked arrogantly and he looked at the boy and he he chuckled and then he said, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Modern science has proven that the Red Sea was not really the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea, and that the water in the Reed Sea was only a, a few inches deep. Anybody could have walked across it. It was, it was kind of like a marshy area, he starts telling the boy. Anybody could have walked across that water. I mean, I'm telling you, everything in that book is, is not real. It's made up. And, and the boy, he, he just looked at the college student for a few minutes, kind of in, in amazement and wonder. And boy, that college kid, he really thought he had him. The boy didn't respond initially. He didn't know really what to say. So he just sat there for a few seconds. And he let that college kid soak in his pride. And then the boy said, thank you. The college kid said, what, what do you mean, thank you? And he said, thank you, you just proved to me how great God really is. He said, in fact, I hadn't really understood how great God really is until just right now. And the college kid said, what do you mean? I just proved to you God is not great at all. And the boy, he said, no, you proved to me he's even greater than I thought he was before you sat down. And the college kid said, well, I don't understand. The boy said, well, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> he said, let's say you're right about those few inches of water. Let's say, let's say you got that exactly right, and modern science got that exactly right. And the college kid said, well, of course I'm right. The boy said, then God's even greater and more powerful than I ever thought. Not only did he lead them across on dry ground on that day, then he topped all that off by drowning the entire Egyptian army in just a few inches of water. <laughs> he, he, said, he said, you do realize that was the most powerful army in the world at the time. These were grown men on chariots and horses. And my God drowned them all in just a couple of inches of water. 
See, that's what I want you to understand as we move into this text. No matter how you slice it, God is awesome. Second observation is this. I told you at the start of this series, there were going to be things about these miracles that we could not understand, that we would not understand. And today, we face the most difficult miracles of all when it comes to our understanding. Today's miracles have absolutely unanswerable questions. More unanswerable even than the other things that we've looked at. In fact, let me just read to you what a couple of commentators wrote about these texts. One said all kinds of historical questions remain unanswered about both these events. But their significance clearly lies in the theology Matthew wishes to convey. Judgment against the temple has begun and the new age of salvation in history has dawned. That's really the point. Matthew is the only one, for example, to record these bodies being risen from the grave. And we don't know why he chose to record that and the others didn't. But it had something to do with the theology that he wanted his Jewish readers to understand. But we, we don't understand why. Carson, he wrote this, what kind of bodies do these holy people have? Do they die again? How many people saw them? How public were these appearances? More questions. A quick reading of the text gives us the impression that though these holy people were raised when Jesus died, it says they did not leave the tombs or appear to the citizens of the holy city until after Jesus' resurrection in verse 53. What were they doing in between? We just don't know. And we are not told. Another said, If these saints were genuinely resurrected rather than simply revived or reanimated like Jairus' daughter or Lazarus, then presumably, like Jesus himself, they appeared to others only for a short time and were eventually taken to heaven. But the text refuses to satisfy our curiosity about these points. Like each of you, I want to know I want my curiosity to be satisfied. But if we are going to remain faithful to God's word and faithful to the text, we cannot wander off into speculation and assumptions. We have to be content with only knowing that God in his sovereignty has chosen not to tell us. And if you can be okay with that, then I think you are going to leave here today blessed. And if you can't be okay with that, you're going to leave here today frustrated. Because we're not going to answer all those questions you want your curiosity to be solved about. So with those two things in mind, let us humbly approach our text, Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. We covered that last week. And then it says this, the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. Let's pray. Father, we approach this part of your scripture and your word and indeed your gospel with humble hearts understanding that we do not have the imagination nor the intellect nor the spiritual vision to understand all that is contained in these two miraculous events. But we do know they prove many things, and among them are that you are an awesome God who loves us and cares for us. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would reveal that love in a mighty and powerful way this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. In these two miracles, we find three of the greatest characteristics of God. I don't want to focus on the unanswerable questions because we could spend all day there. Instead, I want to point you to three of the greatest characteristics of God and how they are revealed through the miracle of the earthquake and the miracle of these resurrections. The first blank in your outline is this. It's power. We see God's power revealed in both of these miraculous events that happen while Jesus dies for our sins on the cross. Both the earthquake and the resurrection of the people in the tombs show the eternal power of God. 
Earthquakes have long been a sign and an instrument and a symbol of God's power. We see, for example, in Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, where it says Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. Nahum chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 says, The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his burning anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. Even rocks are shattered before him. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10 is yet another example where it says, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and eternal King. The earth quakes at his wrath. And the nations cannot endure his fury. Isaiah prophesied in 29, verses 5 and 6, Your many foes will be like fine dust, and many of the ruthless like blowing chaff. Suddenly, in an instant, you will be punished by the Lord of armies with thunder, earthquake, and loud noise, storm, tempest, and a flame of consuming fire. Haggai is yet but another example of showing how God's power is revealed through the shaking of the earth in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, where it says, For the Lord of armies says this, Once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. The power of God is supreme to all you know, to all you have seen, to all you have ever experienced. And that supreme power had been on display for a very, very long time. And yet, here on this day, as the Son of God dies on the cross, it is displayed yet again in this earthquake that happens. It should come to no surprise to us that on the very day, indeed, almost simultaneously with the very moment that the Son of God is murdered on the cross by the very people He had come to save, that God would shake the earth. As powerful as God is and as stunning of an example of His power as this earthquake would have been, we also see God's power on display in an even more magnificent way through the power of resurrection. Of course, the resurrection of Jesus is not the first resurrection in the Bible. But the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation for all resurrections. Not because He was the first to be resurrected, but because Jesus is the first to be resurrected and not die again. You see, His resurrection was an eternal resurrection. He conquered death once and for all. In fact, we see other resurrections. We're fixing to read about one in Luke chapter 7. And Jesus performed that resurrection. It was one of the three resurrections he performed during his ministry. But his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, that we see a few days after this earthquake and these other resurrections, is the foundation because he's the first one to be raised that conquered death. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's an eternal resurrection, not a temporary one. But the point we see here is that the power of God is found in these resurrections. Look at me uh, in Luke chapter 7, for example, where Jesus performs a resurrection. It says afterwards, I'm starting in verse 11, afterward he was on his way to a town called Nain. His disciples and a large crowd were traveling with him. And just as he neared the gate of the town, a dead man was being carried out. 
He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was also with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Don't weep. Then he came up and touched the open coffin. And the pallbearers stopped and said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. And then look at what happened. Then fear came over everyone, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout Judea and all the vicinity. You see, resurrection shows the power of God. Amen? Amen. I mean, if you would have been there in Nain on this day, would you have not said, God has visited his people today? This doesn't just happen all the time. There is great power in this man. They, they were amazed at the power of God on this day because this boy was resurrected back to life. And his life was not eternal. He would pass through death yet again. So how much more do we see it in the resurrection of Jesus? But just like we see it here, we see it on this day that the tombs are open. We see the power of God. How could anybody deny the power of God as these people are raised to life? And come forth from the tombs. Look at the resurrection of Lazarus, another well-known resurrection in the Bible. John chapter 11, starting in verse 45, it says, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. They saw the power of God and they believed in him. But it does say in verse 46, But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. You see, some saw the power of God and believed. Others saw the power of God and did not believe. But everybody saw the power of God. No matter how you slice it, our God is a mighty God. He is a powerful God. And that earthquake on that day, in conjunction with all else that had happened, showed God's power, as did those tombs bursting forth with life and those resurrections taking place. We not only see God's power, though, we see something else here, one of the great characteristics of God, and that is His precision. We see the great precision of God in both of these miracles. In both the earthquake and the resurrection of these saints, we are reminded that we serve a powerful God and a God of great precision. Our God is precise. He precisely knits us together in our mother's womb. He precisely knows the number of hairs on our head. He precisely placed every star in their small space in the sky of the universe. He precisely suspended our planet on nothing at just the right place at just the right angle, with just the right rotation speed to make it an awesome place for us to live. He precisely called your name and saved you from your wretchedness and your trespasses and your sins. You see, we serve a God of great precision. And we see that here in our text when it says, Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. This earthquake was precise in its effect. In other words, it didn't level the city, but it got everybody's attention. Those who came out of the tomb were another sign of God's great precision. Not everybody came out of the tomb on that day. If you travel with us to the Holy Land this fall, as we visit Jerusalem, you will see that it is surrounded by cemeteries and tombs of the ancients. And it was from those tombs and from these cemeteries that some came forth, but not everybody came forth. Carson, who is a better, far better biblical expert than me on the biblical languages, wrote this. He said, on several details, we're told very little. For instance, it's unclear whether the resurrection of these holy people was to natural bodies or to supernatural bodies. The latter is perhaps more likely. And in that case, they did not return to the tombs. And their rising testifies that the last day had dawned. 
Where they ultimately went, Matthew does not say. Were they translated? We do not know. Nor does he tell us who they were. But the language implies, though it does not prove, that they were certain well-known Old Testament and intertestamental Jewish saints, perhaps spiritual heroes and martyrs in Israel's history. We can't know for sure who these people were that God called forth from the tombs, but we can know for certain that God knew who they were. And God had a precise purpose for choosing them. The precision of God is both precious and mysterious. I love the precision of Jesus in John chapter 11 at the resurrection of Lazarus. Have you noticed how precise he is? After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, unwrap him and let him go. It's been said that Jesus had to call him precisely by his name. Not so that he could be resurrected, but so that every dead body within earshot of Jesus didn't rise and come out of the grave. He precisely called him by name. Lazarus, come out. We can even see God's precision in natural events like this earthquake. We see it in places like 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. When it says, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. And at that moment the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing the mountains and was shattering the cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And it says, suddenly a voice came to him and said, You see, God was precisely where Elijah needed him to be. And God had a precise question for him. What are you doing here? Listen, no matter how you slice it, our God is powerful. And no matter how you slice it, he is a God of intricate an amazing precision. You are not here by accident. Your God is a God of precision. Let me quickly wrap up with this last thing. We see I could go on here, but let's talk about the third point. Point number three on your blank outline app, whatever you're following along on is this. We see God's provision. Again, we see it both in the earthquake and the resurrections that happened on this day. We see the provision of God. This isn't the only time God uses an earthquake as part of his provision, or resurrection for that matter. For example, we see it in Acts chapter 16. He brings his provision through an earthquake. It says, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. There was a jailbreak on account of this earthquake. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, David is recounting the provision of God in his life in this song. He's talking about how God rescued him, and I want you to see how he describes that rescue. But first, let me read to you verses 1 and 2. David spoke the words of this song to the Lord On the day the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the grasp of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Now jump down to verse 8 for the sake of time. He says, then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the heavens trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. 
It was part of the provision he saw in his life. It's not hard to see how every resurrection in the Bible is a miracle. The Bible puts on full display the mighty provision of God through the power of resurrection. So here in this earthquake and the resurrection of these saints who we do not know who they were or where they went or how it happened or what they looked like, but we do know it was part of God's great provision for His plan and for His people, for all of humanity. See, God was trying through this earthquake and through these resurrections to get the world's attention. He was trying to get your attention. He's trying to get my attention. He's trying to get everybody's attention. Because what we see here, when it says suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, this is actually a foreshadowing of what's to come. God's trying to provide for all of humanity by saying, wake up, you sleepers. Open your eyes, open your ears, and open your heart. Open your eyes to see and your ears to hear and your heart to receive what I am doing. Because this is but a glimpse of what is to come. In fact, John MacArthur in his commentary of this text, writes the following, Therefore, when God shook the earth at the death of His Son, He gave the world a foretaste of what He will do when one day He shakes the earth in judgment at the coming of the King of Kings. Can I just tell you, church, God doesn't want anybody to perish. His heart is for all to be saved, for all to know His love and peace and grace. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And on that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. The earthquake and these resurrections were miracles to show the love of God and His great provision and power for your life and mine. It's also a way for God to get our attention by foreshadowing what will soon take place. We see a better picture of it over in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, where it says, Then I saw Him open the sixth seal. Guess what? A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of hair. The entire moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a high wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? No matter how you look at it, no matter how you slice it, our God is a God of great power, a God of great precision, and a God of great provision. He gave us a glimpse, a foreshadowing, a foretaste of what is to come so that we might open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and receive Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins as our Lord and Savior, that we might repent of our sins before he comes like a thief in the night and shakes the world again. In these miracles, we are left to wonder about many mysterious and unanswerable things. But we are not left to wonder about the most important things of all, which are the power of our God, the precision of our God, and the provision of our God. I pray that you would accept His provision today, that you would repent of your sins and give your life to Jesus.
that you would call on him, the only name under heaven by which anybody can be saved. Let's pray. Maybe this morning God is whispering in a still small voice in your heart saying, what are you doing here? He's calling you unto himself. He's not calling you to a church. He's calling you to himself. If you can hear his voice, if you desire to repent and believe and know this God of great power and precision and provision, if you desire to accept the provision that he brought to you on the cross through the blood of Jesus, And just say this, Lord, it's me. I'm here in your presence. And I repent of my sins. I admit that I've gone astray and messed things up. And (laughs) Lord, I've run from you and hidden from you. I've let you down. Today, by faith, I leave it all at the foot of the cross. I accept what you did for me and ask that you would wash me clean from the inside out with the blood of Jesus. I thank you for your power, for your precision, and for your provision. Lord, texts like these are scary. Scary because we don't understand them. Scary because of all the unanswered questions that surround them. Scary because of all the people who make assumptions and speculate and get away from the text and try to build it up into their own idea of what happened on that day. And Lord, if we're honest, it's It's scary just because we see how big and mighty and miraculous you are. Lord, my prayer today is that we would not be scared, but we would be emboldened. Father, that it would give us the courage to know that you are a big, big God. And that you hold us in the palm of your hand. You love us. You care about us. And you want to use us for your glory. Father, I pray that we could just accept that and humbly submit to your will for our lives this day and in this week to come. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.